All right, here we are, we are live. Welcome everybody uh, to Children's Book World. I'm Heather and David Wiesner is here with me today. We are super excited to celebrate the release of Robo Baby. Um, I know David needs no introduction, but I will do a very quick one. Um, David published his first book in 1980. <laughs> he has, oh, I know. He's published 30, almost 30 books now. Three of them have been Caldecott winners. Three of them have been Caldecott honors. And I, which mathematically, that means probably 20% of your books have those nice little stickers on them. Nice. And that number about uh, 16 of those that I don't talk about anymore. So. <laughs> Forget those. Those never happened. But this happened. This happened, and this is amazing and exciting. And I can't wait for you all to hear about the process. This book had me in stitches. It is a book we need right now. It is fun and chaotic and lighthearted and has the best surprise twist. And, and the end it will laugh out loud. You will laugh out loud. So I'm going to turn this over to David. And um, thank you very much for being with us. All right. Hello, everybody. Hopefully there's people out there. Um, so Rebel Baby, uh, I'm going to take you through the book, but it grew out of um, an app that I did, which I hope some people saw called Spot, um, which had a series of different worlds. And there was a robot world in there. And um, I didn't get to use a ton of stuff. And I liked the characters and I liked the setting and I thought, you know, I can, I can make a book out of these characters. And as I thought about robots and pictured them uh, being put together, I mean, they had, you know, they would have to be assembled and um, showing up in a box and who would, you know, be better to assemble than a brand new baby. And the family that I had in mind, the arrival of the new baby, um, was perfect and compounded by the uh, uh, advancements in technology, shall we say. Uh, I know certainly in my house, uh, whenever we need some computer work done or have questions, my wife and I will go, kids, <laughs> uh, because they always know everything. So all of that came together to um, create the world of Robo Baby. And Right on the cover, um, we see uh, the character of Cathode. Uh, all of the characters are, have names that are the names of machine parts or machines or electrical components. Um, so uh, there's Cathode holding her uh, new baby brother, Flange. And as the story opens, we see um, there's a vehicle there and it's open and uh, the new arrival is being taken out of the back of the car. and um, that's mom and dad. And in the background, in the, the door of the house, we see there's Kathy, as uh, Cathode is known, and her pet, uh, not really a dog, but I tend to call him a dog, uh, Sprocket. And they're going to bring the new baby into the house. And uh, here they come in, and you can see the neighborhood, all these rows of houses. And um, if you look uh, across the street, there's another dog, if you will, uh, watching. Uh, there's the, the delivery car is now flying away. Uh, going into the house, we see uh, mom and dad carrying the little bundle of joy. There's Sprocket outside, uh, giving the evil eye to the dog across the street. And if you look carefully over to the right, you'll see um, a couple of the robots moving uh, between the houses. They're going to show up in a little while. And when the story actually begins, page one, here's mom and dad and Kathy. That's dad, Lugnut, on the left, and uh, mom, Diode, is on the right. And uh, Lugnut says, Cathode, meet your new baby brother. And when we turn the page, we meet Flange. And, of course, because Flange is a robot, he comes in a box. And uh, there's Kathy. She's very excited. She says, look, Sprocket, he's a Flange. And there she's got her toolbox. And you can see the toolbox with her name on it in red. There's Sprocket going clank, clank, which is how I imagine a robot dog would bark. 
Um, behind them is the crib. I'll tell you about the designing the crib later. But here's Flange. He's come in this big box. You can see it weighs 278 pounds. This is a seriously big box. And he is a Flange. He's a, the new model Flange from the Robo Baby Incorporated. Um, Eagle-eyed viewers can look very closely at that shipping label, and there's some hopefully amusing little puns um, in the address to where it went. And Diode, mom says, oh, such a big boy. And dad says, nice package. And now it's time to put together the baby. And uh, they've got the boxes open. And dad is pretty, uh, he's one of those guys who's really into the instructions. This is a uh, diode. You know, babies have gotten a lot more complicated since we built cathode. Oh, lug nut, how hard can it be? Now, Kathy is very ready. She's got a wrench. She's got her screwdriver. She's got her box of tools because she wants to help, man. She knows what to do. She's, I've got my tools, Mom. There's Dad with his uh, giant uh, fold-up instructions. And some of you uh, shoppers may recognize what big store I, I uh, copied those uh, instructions from. Um, yes, and the boxes in the background, uh, the pe uh, packing peanuts are all over the floor. The box with flange is right in the front there, that reddish uh, green, uh, orange. And uh, Diode says, thanks, Kathy, but this is a mother's job, as she's putting the baby's head on a spindle. She goes, easy. Lots of tools. There goes the head. No problem. But... Oh, you know, crash. It is, in fact, harder than it looks. Dad's got the uh, instructions back out. Kathy's trying to catch some of the uh, parts, including Flange's head. Oh, it's a little weird there, but... Um, so, yes, in fact, a little more complicated than they thought. And um, uh, Kathy's picking up some of the pieces with the help of Sprocket. Good boy, Sprocket, she says. Dad's up there with the tools, checking them out. He says, better call your brother, Di. And she does uh, call her brother, Manifold. Says, uh, Manifold, we need your help. He says, I'll be right over on the uh, giant TV screen there. And he shows up. Show me the patient. Thank goodness you're here. Kathy says, hi, Uncle Manny. She's helping him with her tool, his toolbox. You can see he has the big tool belt on and another bag of tools, which Sprocket is checking out. And in the background, you know, the neighbors have shown up. What do you do when there's a new baby? You, you bring food. So here comes one of the neighbors. Hi, neighbor, where's the baby? I've got sludge cake. And there's somebody, another couple in the back with um, some more stuff, which we'll see. And uh, Uncle Manny's ready to come in and do his thing. And here he is with giant and inappropriate tools to work on this, but you know, that's the way he is. Uncle Manny, I can help. Thanks, Kath, but this calls for an expert. And he gets to work. Arr! Click. Whoosh, a settling torch, yes, and a nice whack with a giant hammer and chisel. And voila, there's Flange, except, um, Uncle Manny, you didn't follow the instructions. I made some improvements. Isn't he precious, says mom. Well, now that he's together, everybody's uh, hanging out, having some of that food that showed up. You can see uh, Manny's got a piece of cake, piece of sludge cake, and some greased gears. He's maybe even checking out the rust soup. Mmm, yum. But Kathy's the one who re recognizes there's a problem here. Start him up, Di. Mom, wait, she says. You have to install the updates. We'll do that later, Kathy. And opens up the little door and flanges head, pushes the on button, and whirr, uh-oh. <laughs> it's not just coming on. He's taking off. And immediately starts to fly around the room in uh, giant zigzags, and there go the greased gears flying through the air. There's the, uh, the jet propulsion on uh, flange. The uh, sludge cake getting uh, bumped into the neighbor's head. 
the rust, rust soup is now down on the floor and mom diode has finally contacted the emergency hotline for robo baby incorporated help she says we're on our way this is the robo text you can see the three little guys down there we're watching what's going on and poor kathy all she wants all she wants is to play with her new baby brother flange but no one is listening to her well here come the robo text look out kid move it out of the way um, and not only the Robotex, but hi, Cathode, I brought Piston and Clutch to see the baby. Aunt Gasket. Aunt Gasket has shown up with her two kids, uh, Clutch and Piston. And the kids are just absolutely enamored of Sprocket. Spocky, Sprocket! And start chasing him all the way. There they go. Well, the Robotex come in and they open up their like little Swiss Army knife uh, robots. Uh, all the little doors open up and different tools come out. But then out comes their uh, giant net, which they uh, they catch uh, Flange with. Got him! Oh, he needs a complete overhaul. And now finally, Cathode has kind of had enough, and she says, "Go, Sprocket!" and There we go. Fetch the baby and Sprocket, Sprocket. <laughs> I'm sounding like those kids. Sprocket grabs uh, Flange and heads off. Um, they've come up with a plan and the uh, people are now jumping out of the way, again, knocking all the food all over the place. Oh, be careful, Sprocket. And there's uh, Sprocket holding Flange and uh, the Robotech's coming after him. No, come back. And all of them pile out the door, uh, chasing Sprocket, trying to get Flange back. Sprocket, bad boy. Get him, Lug. I'm trying. Oh, no. <laughs> there goes that cake again. That thing is taking a beating. Uh, one of the Robotex is now bouncing through the air. The greased gears are going flying. Everybody's going after Sprocket and the baby. And wait. Catch him, stop, come back, stop. Where did they go? They can't find him now. Sprocket! There's Sprocket, hiding behind one of the houses with Flange. And finally he takes Flange and comes back to Kathy, which was the plan all along. Good boy, now let's get to work. Clank, clank. And again, she's got her tools in her uh, toolbox ready and sits down with uh, with Flange and gets to work. And we can see her with her little uh, head flashlight on and tools, Allen wrenches laid out on the floor and a settling torch herself. And she's doing the uh, updates as well, which you can see on the uh, laptop computer. Uh, the installation is 93% complete. If you look on the left side, you can see all the different model numbers, uh, robot models to pick from. There's chisel and clutch, crankshaft, cylinder, diode, drill bit, electrode, flange, flywheel, gasket, grommet. And everybody finally comes in and realizes she knows what she's doing. And, oh, you're such a good big sister. Great job, Kathy. And little flange, finally, um, this is the point at which uh, the previous page, Flange's eyes actually light up and is put together correctly. And he says, well, I don't know how you say that. Put, put, put. Um, little engine noises. And now it's time everybody's going to head home uh, now that the baby's all together. Uh, you can see the Robotech guys have success. Cage closed. They're going to take credit for everything. Um, in the background, we see the family. I've blown this up really far, so it's very grainy. Spocky! Those kids are never going to let up. So long. Thanks, Manny. Bye. And the neighbors over on the other side. Your soup is delicious. I toast the zinc. And finally, Uncle Manny says to one of the other neighbors, my niece, the kid's got talent. I agree. Well, finally, everybody's left, and we're all have a little uh, rest and things have calmed down. Diode says, you've had an exciting day, haven't you, Flange? Now it's time to rest. Mm. Dad, Lugnut, is picking up everything off the floor and says, ah, peace and quiet. 
And back there, there's Cathode by the box saying, Mom, Dad, look. Now, you can see Sprocket is pulling that orange box out from the packing peanuts. And if you were to go back and look earlier in the book, um, way over on the right side, you'll see amid the packing peanuts, there's a little orange box. Well, it's still there. And here comes Sprocket pulling it out. And when we finally turn the last page, we see what it is. It's the Robo Bonus Baby, Axel Twins, says Mom. Well, I hope this time they will know right off to let Kathy uh, get in on the action and uh, put the baby together. So uh, this is the story of Robo Baby. Um, and Heather, anytime you're ready. I'm back. <laughs> Round of applause. That was great. So I want to encourage people to uh, ask some questions. Feel free to type in. Um, we have a couple. I know. Um, oh, I'll start with some questions and then we have some of our own too. So how has creating the illustrations for your books changed from your first picture book to this one? There's that question. Wow. That could be a whole show. Yes, it could. Well, um, so there's there's kind of two uh, answers to that. The first picture book I did was very early. It was a little reader, cute little animals, um, pre-separated art. It was a whole different thing. Um, there's really a vast difference between the work that I did for books for other authors and the books that I wrote myself. Um, when I began writing books myself, Freefall was the first of those. Um, I only did one other book for another author after that, uh, Eve Bunting's Night of the Gargoyles. Um, so really those books, the, that's, <laughs> those are the real books. Um, that's when, um, you know, I came into my own. I was, I was not meant to illustrate other people's books. I was meant to write my own. And the difference in the art that I did, not that I wasn't trying to do those other books the best I could, but, um, the work that I did for my own stories was just so much better and interesting and executed better and everything. Um, so over the years, I've tried uh, things differently. I don't know if I could paint pictures like I did for Freefall anymore. Um, it, in many ways, it's, I'm working the same way, but it's a, a level of painting that's just um, thinner, lighter washes of color and, um, I, I, you know, I look at those and I go, boy, how did I do that? Uh, it's, it's, things have changed um, in the way that I apply the paint and build up the colors, the intensity of the colors. Um, and that largely comes out of the stories, the, you know, different stories demand a different approach. And so I've tried a lot of different things. The basic process is very similar, but the outcome uh, can actually be quite different. That was a long answer, sorry. <laughs> that, was a, that was a good answer. And it's interesting because you said about colors, the intensity of colors, and that's sort of our next question. How do you decide the color palette for each of your books? Um, early on, Freefall is one of those cases. I, um, I tended to start with an underpainting that used a certain set of colors, um, ultramarine blue, Payne's gray, raw umber. And really build up quite a lot of the light and the dark and um, uh, very almost like a, a whole painting done in a very limited palette and then layer because watercolors, obviously they're transparent. So when you put a one color over another, whatever's underneath it affects the color you put down. Um, so there tended to be a certain look and a feel, very much more muted set of colors, softer colors. Um, but um, when I began when working on Tuesday, it was like the dead of night and I just kept layering more and more color, more intense colors. And the intensity of it was like, wow, it was actually scary to paint that way. But it really freed me up to, um, sort of get away from letting the underpainting dictate the look of it. And then ultimately each book kind of tells me the where it wants to go. Flotsam is one where it's a bright sunny day on the beach. There's plastic buckets and toys, you know, very brightly colored plastic things and sun. And I started the first picture. I went, oh, this is going to be the bright color book, at least for me. <laughs> and, um, 
And that kind of dictated a lot of the look of that. The, color, the cover has more red on it than I've used in all paintings I've ever done up to that point. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, I used to paint, and I still do most of the time. Um, I don't, I use watercolor, but never use black or white watercolor. Um, when I was doing Mr. Waffles, the cat was a black cat. And I was thinking, well, the black, I, I can use a lot of different um, purples and dark blues and different things to make a dark color. And then I thought, wait a minute, why don't I use black? <laughs> and, um, and it was great. It was just so beautiful to build up these layers of um, black. It's almost velvet. Of course, there, there's actually some color underneath that all. But So each book kind of has a color thing going on um, that... I find out literally when I start painting. I don't go in with a really with a plan. Um, it's the one spontaneous is not a word to use around any of the work that I do. But I don't. I plan out all the drawings, the compositions, the layout of the pages, the pacing of the book. Everything is very carefully done. The painting is the one thing I sort of start, and it's like let's see where it takes me. Um, yeah. That's so. That's so interesting because I have to say when I, when I was looking through the book and I saw you know these robots and they're very they're gray and they're metallic and there's so much humanity and for me I think part of it was the the goldens and the orange it lends this sort of human this humanity to them and I thought oh, that must have been very intentional and now you're telling me it wasn't no <laughs> so, no um, the actual color color I knew okay. that and they weren't all going to be gray robots, you know. Yeah. Um, so because there's copper, brass, yeah. bronze, uh, cast iron, all these different metals have different color to them. So I wanted to use that range. And then I heightened them. The That's mm -hmm. not really copper. That's not really brass and bronze. Um, the, the yellow's pushed a little farther. The orangey reddish is pushed a little farther. Um, and because they just, they sort of became their own color things. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know how, you know, for you or the audience, how far you go back, but Iron Man in the early days, you know, he was yellow and orange. Right, it's true. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, Jack Kirby kind of uh, set, <laughs> <laughs> set the case. For so that was a case of I, I knew those color range was going to be in there, but once I started working on them, I just kind of I pushed them out of the reality of those colors so that they would really be more vivid and, um, you know, give it, as you said, I love that you, you know, yeah. humanity of the characters, yeah. uh, you know, try to bring them alive. Yeah. Well, we have all also decided that that's the color palette we want for our fall wardrobe. <laughs> Just so you know. Yeah, like, you look at the shirt I'm wearing and the, the, wall, the color of the wall, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> our next question is from Adrian Wright, who you know. Hi, David. I know you make 3D models for some of your characters before drawing them. Did you build some of these characters before? Thanks for feeding me that one, Adriana. <laughs> one would think I asked you to do that. <laughs> Here's one of my models. Oh, that's um, cool. So yes, I'm going to come over here and show you my models. Um, <laughs> so just because um, I'm going to jump in here for a second. Um, when I was working, I mentioned Spot. Here's one of the drawings of the family, you know, the robot family at the time. I know that's kind of gruesome. They're carving up a robot carcass for dinner. <laughs> okay. So when I started uh, thinking about the story and the mom and dad and all of this, and then everybody coming over, and again, Heather, thank you, because you used the word mayhem early on. Uh, that was an intentional thing. This just, and it went to reminding me when I was started working on this of um, the great, great scene from the Marx Brothers and Night at the Opera where the Marx Brothers, the three Marx Brothers, are in a stateroom, a tiny stateroom on a ship. And slowly but surely, endless series of people show up and go into the stateroom. The guy with the wrench, the manicurist lady, the woman with the broom, the mop to clean up, and then like six guys with trays full of food um, until the place is literally packed with people on top of each other. And then the fabulous final scene when Miss Margaret Dumont opens the door. So, um, you know, this, that 
I just had in my mind this, this, you know, more people, more people, let's fill this place up until we, I ended up with 13 robots in there and had them spilling out at the end. Um, so all of these different shapes, I loved them. They were mostly um, uh, symmetrical, thank you. Yeah, I'll figure it out. And, you know, things like looking at collapsible drinking cups, which, you know, can bend kind of. And, you know, I started doing these quick drawings of, you know, different uh, character studies. Um, and when I was had my sort of uh, cast of characters together, um, I then did these technical drawings. Again, since they're symmetrical, I only needed one view. Uh, but they're all there with the uh, various uh, measurements and stuff. Uh, my son, who gets a shout out at the front of the book in the thank yous, uh, knows CAD and uh, created the files needed uh, to send off to a place to get 3D printed models. Usually I make my models out of modeling compound, like model magic. Um, but this time I thought, well, let's get 3D printed uh, plastic robots. So yeah, I got to market these babies, you know, collect them all. All right. <laughs> um, but again, I can pick this up and hold it in any orientation from above, from below, um, change the lighting to see what that looks like um, and see how it, you know the light falls across these various forms and use them um, to draw and paint from. So here they are sitting on my light table with the light from below, which I'll just throw in. I have been waiting so many years to do a book where the light source is in the floor of a house. <laughs> this goes back to the vast impression. Anybody who's read stuff on my website will know how much 2001 affected me. But late in this movie, in that weird hotel room, the floor is lit. The floor is the light source. And I have been just going, man, I got to use that someday in a book. And I finally found the book to do it. Also throw in another cat people, the great cat people with uh, these underlit scenes with the drafting tables. So the houses in these robot worlds have their light source in the floor. Um, and that made me so happy to be able to do that. So all of these things came together. And yes, uh, here's, as I said, here's, here's lug nut, <laughs> um, you know, my, the little models. Awesome. Well, the, you answered that was Rebecca's question was, could you talk about the use of the floor as a light source? So you answered that perfectly. Um, you, for feeding me another uh, gimme. <laughs> So um, I, I do have a question that um, the line in the book, you have to install the updates. Yes. I feel like as a parent, I can't tell you how many times my, every time I do something wrong, my children are like, you didn't install the updates. You didn't install the updates. Is that something your kids just said to you over and over again? Um, Is that where that came from? Yeah, it certainly did because, you know, I knew you had to, install updates, but occasionally I would still forget. But often it was, how do we install the updates? And, um, you know, they were just really handy to have around. And I'm sure there are millions of parents in, around the world who, when it comes to, oh, no, there's another update. You know, Bobby, Susie. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if we knew how to install them, we'd probably do it as frequently as we're supposed to. Because because then you you do the installation and you open it up and you go, oh, it's all different. They changed it. Why did they change that? And right. Out changing it all the time, which yeah. drives parents crazy. So, um, yeah, yeah, that definitely was the uh, the driving thing there. That uh, you, And it was, you know, so all of these things, you know, I'm thinking about the robots uh, building them. It takes me to, you know, the baby coming and being assembled and the family going, oh, yes, how do we do this? And the first versions, again, I could show you all of this, but um, the first versions was more about the mayhem and the mom and dad and Kathy were much more passive and watching this happen to them. And then Kathy would kind of, at the end, kind of came in and helped out. But it, it would, you know, of course, I draw this out and I go, oh, wait a minute, of course. And the book is about her. It's really about her. So right from the get-go, you know, her desire to play with Flange to help and tell people she knows what she's doing is driving the story. Um, and that for me is the way I write and it probably to quote writers, <laughs> you know, people who, who were, use words for a living, um, that would be, you know, oh, of course, right off the bat. Yeah. 
but I, I have to draw it. I have to see it. And most times I draw it out. I just, let's put it all down. And then I go, oh, that's what's going on here. You know, so it's the art that reveals to me what's happening in the story. And stuff comes out of that that I probably wouldn't think of otherwise. Um, because when I start drawing, I'm just, I'm drawing anything and everything that comes to mind. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a process that works for me and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> um, well, our next question, speaking of process, how long was the process for making this book? Um, so this was similar to many of my books. I'd say it, uh, it topped two years uh two and a quarter ish it took me oh my god a slightly over a year to paint the thing just paint the thing <sighs> i haven't i haven't painted like this in a while um and i forgot how ridiculously time consuming um it was my back was killing me by the end of the process um uh, so the, the question mark is always how long the story will take, and that can sometimes come very quickly, and sometimes it can be a very drawn-out process. Watson was three and a half years. Um, the story took a long time um, and went through huge changes. Um, there was a sort of a basic arc to this, although it modified a lot and refined a lot. Um, but, yeah, two years is, is pretty standard. Occasionally, uh, Mr. Waffles was the... Well, there's a much longer story to that, but when the story just popped out, I drew it out. I drew the dummy. It was like it was all there. I took it in and showed my editors, yes, let's do it. That's not what I was going to be doing. Um, and probably 13, 14 months later, I was done. So that was one for me. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of, you know, just knocking that baby out. Um, so you never know. I never know. I wish I could plan it. Uh, so but. during that time, when you're working on the book, if something comes into your head, do you ever stop and get that down? Or do you just basically say, go away, I'll get you eventually? Are you that oh, I I do. Um, do yeah. I, I, Yes, I have, a, I, you know, one of my sketchbooks, I'll make notes, I'll make little drawings, and but go back to it. I don't stop and kind of, I, and work it out. It's when I'm done and I'm ready for the next thing that I pull those out and start to see what looks viable. Um, I had over a dozen things that I was, when I finished this, that I was going to be choosing from. Um, and almost none of them on a story basis got to where I felt they needed to, um, which was making me nuts for the almost a year now. Um, I, I'm now, I found it <laughs> and it wasn't one of those, well, it kind of in some ways was um, elements, but from a different angle, from a different place. And I love that, you know, it was like, oh, this is really cool. Um, I, I kind of wish it had been one of the other ones, but the ultimate thing is, is the story worth me spending the next two years on? And, you know, that's, what yeah. every all the drawings all everything that i'm making it's all about the story and the story's got to be good enough to move forward with and none of those things much to my surprise but I, it's always different you, you know if i could plan this out <laughs> i'd be knocking the books out <laughs> it doesn't work that way um it just you the story you have, and you know it. You know, I know it when I yeah, see it. You know when you see it. And then you go, you know, why didn't I see that, you know, X number of months ago? It seems so obvious now, but um, that's the creative process for you. So changing gears, just a second. We <laughs> have had um, a, a very fun time reading this in the store, particularly because of all of the funny names. Oh, yeah. The characters. <laughs> How long did it take you to come? I mean, Aunt Gasket is like, <laughs> the perfect name. I mean, how long did it take you to come up with those names? And did you go with different versions first? So um, I know I'll bet. Well, I know one person um, online is aware of something I did very early back in the, the late 90s, uh, a little scene, little, little scene, uh, interactive CD-ROM called The Day the World Broke. 
which was all about these mechanical, half mechanical, half biological creatures that live in the center of the earth. Um, and they, and I copped, cribbed a lot of the names from them. Um, I'm still hoping to use that story and make that story a reality. I feel bad that I, I stole some of the names, but you know, you got to take what you got to take to make a story work. So yes, I had a long list of things. Um, Carbine was one of those characters in The Day the World Broke. My editor said, we can't use Carbine. It's a gun. Um, so, you know, guns are bad. Guns are bad. So I said, fine, no Carbine. But we got, you know, there's uh, uh, the cathode, um, diodes, <laughs> gaskets, lug nuts. Uh, what the heck was that? <laughs> Pistons. What were these? What are these things? I have no idea. Oh, I forget. Manifold. That's a manifold. Oh, manifold. <laughs> I forgot. Like it's not a sprocket. <laughs> and there's a sprocket. There um, we go. So, um, yeah, it was great. Um, there were things that I, there aren't actually any kids listening, are there? <laughs> <laughs> there were a couple names. Uh, one name that I changed because my daughter, uh, my just college graduated daughter, said that that name is very close to a, uh, a, a term that is not a word that we probably should be using. <laughs> so I, an ant, the former ant became Ant Gasket. Okay. Uh, one of the kids was Gasket, so the kid became Clutch. So it was Piston okay. and Gasket, now it was pitch, Piston and Clutch. Um, other things like the soup was Tungsten Soup. I, forever and ever, I just, Tungsten Soup, I loved it. Um, but it, uh, someone pointed out that tungsten is actually a uh, a conflict mineral. Um, you know, it's it's mined and used to arm rebels, and and the basically the labor used is is practically slave labor and stuff. Um, so I had to find a new name for the soup, and but I had all this was late. I would already had painted, done the painting, and the word balloon size was pretty much set because it had to fit and not crop onto the character's head. And so, you know, magnesium wouldn't fit, aluminum wouldn't fit, all of these things with M's and N's are very long letters visually. And I had to find a funny short name to use. Oh, I can't tell you how long it took. And finally, my again, my daughter says, uh, how about rust soup? Um, rust is like the uh, fungus of metal. So it's really like, Mushroom soup. Mushroom. <laughs> this is great. Um, so in the end, um, yeah, tungsten soup became rust. So there are little things like that that crop up that are just, you know, oh, my gosh. But I, I was hampered by the need to fit the name in a certain space because I had already been designed for a, a, a specific word balloon size. And those are the times you go, ah! <laughs> Those are the things we would not know had you not been here to tell us, which we really, really appreciate. I know uh, it's sort of getting time to say goodbye, but before we do, is there any other things you want to leave us with? Um, any other little morsels you want to share? So um, I'll just, since we were talking about it, well, yes, Ikea. Um, <laughs> I couldn't do the umlaut um, because in the text, in the when they're talking, we weren't going to use the umlaut. Um, obviously, and editorially, it's that's a bad thing. You can't do it one way, one place, and something else another way. Um, but it was still fun to sort of create my own IKEA catalog. Um, but the wallpaper, you know, is centered around um, uh, circuit boards, uh, which is the way the walls looked in when I did uh, Spot. Um, so that's the way that, you know, that pattern is basically a circuit board pattern. Of course, there's a little bit of this. There's always a little bit of the shining in my books. <laughs> <laughs> but the um, the neighborhoods, is this, it's all New Jersey. <laughs> you know, driving down the turnpike and watching these giant, um, I love these round things in rows that these gas uh, and oil uh, storage tanks. So, yeah, of course, we there they are out in the, off the Jersey turnpike. Um the crib is uh, basically your Weber grill, uh, modified. Um, so it, in fact, slides around and, and comes over. Uh, the Crib Master uh, 2000. And I'll do this super quick. So the jacket, this, uh, this for me, this was even a record. Um, 
these are all variations on, but they're all different jackets. Does any, I don't know if anybody ever remembers the old poster from uh, Rosemary's Baby back in the 60s. Oh, what a beautiful poster. So there was this, <laughs> it was like Rosemary's Baby. No. <laughs> so these are all the different jackets that I did, which are all just trying to find a way. Oh, yeah. The ones on the right side, this is the Yorick jacket. <laughs> the last poor Yorick. Whoops. Um, uh, then I, boy, did I want to use the one where they were taking his head apart. But anyway, so <laughs> ultimately when I uh, decided on this arrangement of shapes, you know, various becomes that, the painting and then the type. Mm -hmm. So this, I mean, I do this just until um, I find what I need. Uh, and if anybody ever wants, there's, here's page 12. It became this in a rough drawing, the finished drawing, the light blue that was printed onto my um, watercolor paper. And then the, here's the underpainting, a little more of the blue, a little more underpainting, starting to bring in the color. Whoa, color, lots more color. And then the finished page. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, I never take pictures as I'm working and those were pretty crappy, but um, so I'm gonna stop screen sharing. That's a quick <laughs> look at what the painting process kind of looks like. Um, well, that, it's amazing. And I can't thank you enough for sharing your process. Having a book come out and not have I, a uh, event at Children's Book World, it wouldn't be a book. I'm sorry. Know, but we, we feel like you're here. And just for everybody watching at home, these are all signed. You are welcome to go on our website and order. We will ship them to you. But we were lucky that David did sign these for us. I still have uh, a dozen I can personalize. And, and yes. And he's so close he can personalize. And since the books do take you two and a half years, well, next time it'll be in person. We are all hoping. We will be. But we are thrilled to have this because I can't even tell you. It's just, it's a joy to read. I read it over and over again last night and I laughed every time I read that last page. And Heather, Heather's daughter is known as Kat. So. Yes, <laughs> she is. That's very, even more special to me. Yes. So thank you. My Thank pleasure. you, David. All right. Thanks Take care. Bye-bye, <laughs> everybody. Thanks. Bye.